Hey, good morning, Grace Church. If you're a guest here today, my name is Wes. I'm one of the pastors. It's so good to see you and welcome you here. And did everybody enjoy your extra hour of sleep? Yes. Oh, let's thank God for that. That was good. That's good. I am so glad it happens on Saturday night to Sunday morning. I mean, this is just a gift to all preachers everywhere, including myself. So I'm ready today. Are you ready? Oh, good, good, good. So take out your message notes because we're going to uh, begin a new series today. I'll tell you about that more in a minute because first we need to ask God to come and to be our teacher. In this moment, we've got some extra sleep, so we're ready for God to help us out. I hope you didn't waste your extra hour, right? I hope you went to bed. All right, so if not, we'll just pray that God's mercy comes on you now and gives you energy. All right, so let's pray. Lord, thank you for your presence with us. We do thank you for the gift of every moment. Lord, um, every moment of every day is a gift from you. And Lord, we thank you for the time that we can spend with you this morning. And we pray that you would help us to see you in all of your glory, that we might uh, just continue this song, and the song might be just implanted in our hearts, that the earth is filled with your glory, that our lives are filled with your glory because of the presence of your Holy Spirit. We ask that you would come now and that you would be our teacher. We pray in Jesus' name. Everybody agreeing said, amen. Well, in late 2006, about actually mid-2006 in May, my wife Becky and our then six-year-old son Caleb loaded up all of our belongings into a moving truck, and then we stuffed both of our cars, and we moved from Lexington, Kentucky to Cape Coral, Florida. And I am so happy about that. That's right. Thank you, thank you, Paul, for starting that out. Uh, so I appreciate that. You can keep it up. Yes, yes. Um, we were uh, thrilled to get to join this congregation, thrilled to be a part of Grace Church, thrilled to be a part of this amazing team of leaders and followers of Jesus that God has assembled. Oh, what an amazing thing. And we were also really, really excited on a, on a personal level, just excited because we bought a new home. And we were really thrilled to get to move into a brand new house. And I remember walking in the first day of that house, and you could just smell it. It smelled good. You know what I'm talking about? It was, it was everything worked in the house. It was all really nice. And we walked in this house, and we were like, all right. And I remember uh, just being so thrilled that I could get into this town called Paradise, and I could be a part of this boom town real estate mecca called Cape Coral, Florida. I just thought, Lord, you have blessed me. I just can't believe this is so good. And I remember we first moved in. I remember the first few months going on this website that's out there called Zillow. Uh, it's a real estate website. And I could actually find my home and find the value of my home just going up, 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 and away. And I thought, okay, this is really good. I I'm never going to have to worry about money Again, I mean, it had been a decade of trying to squeak by for us, you know, financially. We'd, we'd gone to, to school, we completed our, our degrees, and I'd been through ordination, I'd planted a church in the inner city, and I was convinced that my lean financial days were behind me. Yeah, <laughs> boy, was I wrong. <laughs> Wow, was I wrong. You ever heard that statement uh, that life is a lot like an ice cream cone? The more that you think you got it licked, that it drips on you, right? That's what I felt like. I felt like I just had been shocked by what was going on, and you know all about it. According to economists, the recession came officially in December of 2007. December 7th of 2007, we in Cape Coral were the feature article for all the wrong reasons on the cover of the New York Times. There was a story that still has accolades today called, This is the Sound of the Bubble Bursting. And over the next few years, you know what happened. Of the 64,000 homes in Cape Coral, 18,500 of them went into foreclosure. We in Cape Coral and Fort Myers, Florida, endured the worst rate of job loss of any metropolitan area in the country. The suicide rate in Cape Coral even skyrocketed. At the point I was visited by our fire chief and decided to help out because of the suicide rate that was happening. You remember those days? In fact, we're in it, aren't we? Yeah. You know all about it because we've lived it together. And there's not a person within the sound of my voice, I'm convinced, even if you're watching online, that has not been affected by this great 
recession. Now, there's no question that recession has impacted our lives. But here's the question going forward. Have we learned anything? Have we learned anything from all that we've experienced together? Because as difficult as the last few years have been, wouldn't the real tragedy be for us not to learn anything from all this? That's why your pastors were very excited about this series that we're kicking off that's going to lead into Thanksgiving called Recession Lessons. Because we want to take a balcony view in these coming weeks, and we want to gain God's perspective on life and money and the stuff that money buys. Now, there's a simple poem by a lady named Portia Nelson called My Autobiography in Five Short Chapters. I'll read it for you. It's very simple. Chapter one, I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I'm lost. This isn't my fault. It takes me forever to find a way out. Chapter two, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place, but it isn't my fault, and it still takes me a long time to get out. Chapter three, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it is there, but I still fall in. It's a habit, I guess. My eyes are open, though. I know where I am. It is my fault, and I get out immediately. Chapter five, no, chapter four. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter 5. I walk down a different street. (laughs) Now, hey, isn't it true? After years of us falling in the same hole over and over again, are you ready to walk down a different street? I am ready to walk down a different street. I mean, we've seen how our our financial systems are fragile. We've seen that... Our world is filled with fallen systems and fallen people, and and we've seen how our plans and our our predictions are not all that reliable. After all, it's time for a different street. It's time for a different way. It's time for a different road. But which one? Well, I'm glad you asked. (laughs) I'm glad you asked. Because, see, most importantly to your pastors and the teaching team, the darkness of this recession has revealed to us once again the brilliance of God's Word. (laughs) See, I hold in my hand the guide, the authoritative word on recession-proofing your life. I need it. You need it. I want it. I desire it. I'm tired of falling in the same hole again and again and again. It's time for a different road, a different street. And let me remind you of a few biblical facts when it comes to money. That the Bible speaks 500 times about prayer. It's wonderful. The Bible speaks... 500 times about faith. But did you know that there are 2,350 verses dealing with money? Of Jesus' 36 parables, 18 of them were about money and economics. There is more spoken about economics in the Bible than any other social issue. And so we need to get in our mind what the eternal principles are about how we deal with resources. You see, if we can get these in our mind, in our heart, and begin to practice them in our lives, then we will live life in the way that God designed it all along. And no more falling in the holes again. And we learn from God's Word that when it comes to money and the stuff that money buys, there are two sides of the coin. Now, when I was younger, when I was a young warthog, as the movie Lion King sings. Uh, You don't have that CD, the soundtrack to Lion King. But when I was a child, just a a youngster, we didn't have the resources, and in fact, they didn't exist yet, those pocket video games that are all around, or those apps on cell phones, that every time you go someplace, you can find something to occupy your mind. In fact, the only thing we had back in the day, uh, as we were drawing pictures on the cave walls and all those kind of things, you know, just uh, in between hunting trips and all those kind of things, what we had was coins. So we could, if we were lucky, have a coin, maybe a penny, if we were really lucky, a quarter, and we could spend the day, like riding the bus or when we're stuck in traffic or we're stuck with our parents, we would spend the day flipping a coin. And we would see, who's going to win? Who's going to win? Right? And we count them up. You know, it was usually 49-51 at the end of 100. And you can try it at home when you, when you get home. All right? It's an exciting game. And you can uh, even encourage your children to play this exciting game because it's almost free. It just costs like a nickel or a quarter, depending on what you want to use. And I used to think of coins as being, uh, the two sides of a coin as being opposite. But here's what I want us to think about today, is that the two sides of a coin are, are 
forever linked together. You can't have one without the other. And we're going to take a look at two sides of a coin when it comes to the money and the stuff money can buy as it pertains to God's Word. So let's take a look at heads first. Are you ready? All right, here's the first fill in the blank. Picture a coin in your mind. Here's the head side of the coin. Look will be at number one, fill in the blank. God owns everything. God owns everything. Say it with me. God owns everything. All right. When I was living in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, we were a part of a very wealthy congregation, very wealthy part of Florida, and we were living there. And there was a bishop that came over from Russia, and some very wealthy Christ followers invited my wife and I over to their house for a lunch. And so we went to this house, and Becky and I were from small town Kentucky. We had never been to any house like the house that we were walking into. I knew we were in trouble when I walked up to the front door and a butler opened the door for us and invited us in. And, and when I get nervous, what I start doing is talking. So I just started talking because I'm a preacher. So I just started talking. I'm a speakaholic. And so I began to just talk. And so I'm saying hi to the butler. And hello, how are you? Oh, you're a butler. Wow, I've never seen a butler before. And here we are. And I'm just started talking along. And I'm, I'm, I started noticing things on the walls. And there was artwork all over the walls. I said, wow, that's a really nice painting. I'd like to have one of those paintings. Where can I get a print of that painting? And he said, that's a Picasso. I'm like, cool, I'll get a print of the Picasso painting. I like Picasso paintings, I guess. I don't know. He goes, no, it's an original Picasso. You can't afford it, he said. And y'all should be on in. I thought, okay, well, I'm out of my element. But I kept talking. And so I, uh, we, we arrived at our, our lunch spot, our designated place at the table there, and I was sitting there, and there were so many forks and knives and, and you know, silverware and everything. I didn't know exactly what to do, but I used every one, tried to, as many as, uh, you know. I figured the forks were kind of like chopsticks. You used two at a time. And so I, I uh, navigated, I thought, pretty well through this, very, this uh, expensive dinner. And then I noticed the guy next to me, an older gentleman, had on a giant gold ring that was had diamonds all over it. And then I noticed it, it said Miami Dolphins on the ring. I thought, oh, wow. And I said, sir, <laughs> I couldn't help but notice that you've got a Miami Dolphins ring, and I like that ring. That ring is really cool. I've even been to a game once. The Dolphins are really cool. I said, are you a fan of the Dolphins? <laughs> and this man shot me a look that I'll never forget. He said, son, I'm not a fan of the Dolphins. I'm one of the owners of the Dolphins. <laughs> oh, I said. I was so embarrassed I stopped talking. Even though I really wanted to say, can I have some tickets to the game? Where, does your, you know, where are your seats at? Can, can you get a helicopter to come pick me up? That would have been cool. <laughs> Friends, we need to understand ownership. Ownership. Let's stay in the football realm for just a moment. God is not a referee. God is not a player. God's not a head coach. God is the owner. He's the owner of everything. The Bible tells us that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it belongs to the Lord. You just sang it, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. Why? Because he owns it. He owns everything. Say, God owns everything. Ready, go. God owns everything, everything in it. We need to get this straight. Now, a man named David in the Bible was a man after God's own heart. And when he was ending his reign as the king of Israel and handing over power to his son Solomon... His son Solomon would be building this grand, massive temple of the Lord. Finally, they would have a temple to worship the Lord in. And so they gathered all of the wealth of the nation that was going to be used for the building of this great temple. And this is why David, despite all of his failures and all of his shortcomings, I think this is why he's called a man after God's own heart. Because as he is pictured in your mind, facing all of this treasure, all of this stuff is there. Look with me at what he prays in 1 Chronicles 29, 11, and 12. Let's read it together. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Wealth and honor come from you alone. For you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand. And at your discretion, people are made great and given strength. Whoa, what a prayer. What a prayer. Isn't that amazing? He gives God his due. 
He's singing, holy is the Lord. He's the God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory, and everything belongs to the Lord. Wealth and honor come from you alone, he says. And I know this goes against what many of us have been thinking, because chances are one of your first five words that you spoke as a child was this word, mine. <laughs> mine, right? Kids just walk around. They just pick up stuff. They come to your house. You ever had a kid over to your house? They come in, they just start picking up stuff, walking around with lamps and everything, and they're like, give me, give me, the, give me that back. It's mine. Mine. We, we're just, that's one of our first words, isn't it? Mine, mine, mine. But what does David say? Well, despite our speaking of, of saying, me, 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 and my, 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 and I, 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 you know what David is praying? He's saying, you, Lord. It's all about you. You alone are the one who owns it all. We are blessed by you, David is saying. Wealth and honor come from you alone. You rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand. It's at your discretion. People are made great and given strength. Now, there's a couple of, of points of view here. We just finished a message series on our mind. And I'm still on the journey with you. I'm, we're renewing our mind, being transformed by the renewing of our mind. And one of the ways we need to continue that transformation is to understand resources, money, and the stuff that money can buy. Because the, the worldly perspective of money is this. There's never enough. Have you noticed that? There's never enough. And so we get all amped up. We get worried about money. We're dominated by a mentality of scarcity. And then we say, even though we've grown up, we say, I own it. It's mine. I'll never have enough. And this money, it's all about me. But a Christ-centered mindset. Get this. Imagine this. It says, God, you own it all. And you, you tell me not to worry, and I'm not going to worry now anymore about money, Lord. Because you care for the fish of the sea, but also the birds of the air, and you will care for me, and I will always have enough. You answer my prayer, Lord, give me today my daily bread. Because of you, I'm blessed. That's a different mindset, isn't it? <laughs> That's a different mindset. And honestly, my first reaction to the news that, that, that God owns everything is either to foolishly deny it or to foolishly debate it with God. I'm just being real transparent here and honest with you. And, and we, we deny this reality when, as adults, we say things like, this is my house, this is my car, this is my, these are my clothes, this is my 401K or my box of, of, of Captain Crunch. That's just what I say. But... Um, and then we'll debate with God. At least I do. Maybe I'm not the only one. Maybe I am. I don't know. But this is what I do. I say, well, God, I earned this. And then the Lord, this is how he talks to me. He'll say, Wes, um, who gave you the ability to earn that? But Lord, I'm just providing for my family. Good, good, good. Who gave you the ability, the ingenuity, the intelligence, the education, the resources? Who gave that to you? And I'll, sometimes I'll be like, well, uh, my mom and dad. <laughs> No, it comes from the Lord's hand, doesn't it? Every good and perfect gift that we have, it comes from a God of love. Everything that we enjoy is a gift. John Ortberg is one of my favorite writers, and he said, you have never received any good thing that did not come to you out of the generosity of God. From your body to every moment of your life, every bite of food you've ever eaten, the clothes you wear, your education, the people you know, that's a generous God who has given that all to us. And see what happens to his friend is that when we try to assume ownership and acquisition and we grab a hold, we find that we get stuck in a hole or stuck in a role that we're not designed to live. There's a story that Chuck Swindoll tells about how the Zulu tribe captures ring-tailed monkeys in Africa. They capture them and... and put them in zoos all over the world. And this is how it's done. These little creatures, I don't know if you ever tried to catch a ring-tailed monkey. Uh, I do this only on Saturdays, but it's a really fun uh, sport, and I'm never very good at it. I'm going to tell you now how to do it, so you're ready to take notes, and here's how. The Zulus have observed that these, these ring-tailed monkeys, they love the seeds of a certain melon. And so they go out, and they, they bore a little hole in a melon, and 
then they put the seeds right there in the melon, and the monkey reaches his little paw in there, and he grabs the seed, and then guess what? They don't bore the hole big enough for him to pull out his hand if it's made into a fist. He has to let go of the seed if he wants to pull his hand out, but the monkey won't do it. The ringtail monkey will just hang on and hold on, and then the Zulus come around him, and they capture it, and then you can go to the Naples Zoo and see one of these creatures, right? <laughs> see, now you know what to talk to the monkey about when you go visit it, right? You're like, I'm sorry, what happened to you? You know, you, you'll know how to have a conversation. You're welcome. So, what is this lesson for us? The same thing happens to us, doesn't it? We try to grab hold, and we hold on so tight, and we find ourselves trapped more and more and more, and then we say, we can't get out of this. What do we do? What do we do, God? And God says, let go. Let go. So when we open our hand, you know what? Then God can bless us with his love and his grace and his peace. We can be free from anxiety. We can be free from working ourselves to the bone. We can be free from all of those things that wear us down. See, God can't give peace to anybody that doesn't have an open hand. So let go. God owns everything. This week I read about a man that... He got fed up with his struggle with worry. And he got just so tired because he was torn back and forth between wanting to live his life God's way and wanting to live his life his way. And he didn't know what to do. And so he sat down one day at his desk. He got out a piece of paper and he wrote down everything in his life. He wrote down about his money, his salary, his income, his house, his education, his car, his clothes. And then he said this. He wrote at the bottom, God, I am deeding this over to you. He created a deed. Just hand wrote one. And he said, God, I deed this to you. You are the owner. From this day forward, it's not mine. It's all yours. What is he doing? He's letting go. You might want to do that today. If you're bored, you might just want to do that right now. You might just want to take your message notes and write out a deed, a title, and put new owner, God. Let him have it all. He owns it all anyway. So, if we're not the owner, what are we? Well, look at the other side of the coin with me. Look at me at number two. Tails. I am God's money manager. See, it's not that we don't have any part in all of this. Yes, everything that we have and we enjoy, it's a gift from a God of love, but it's more than a gift. The things that we have, the money and the things that money buys and the stuff that money buys is a sacred trust. I am God's money manager. We have to get this responsibility in our mind. And whatever portion of money God has entrusted to you, get down on your knees today and thank God for it. And ask for help to become a faithful manager of it. And I know sometimes we say, well, I don't have, and we fill in the blank, and we compare ourselves to other people. Let, let me just remind you, we've got a team that's serving in India today. And compared to the folks that our team is ministering to today, uh, everybody in this room is, is wealthy. Way over 90%. Compared to the rest of the world, billions of whom live on less than two bucks a day. Two dollars a day. So if you make a thousand bucks a year, you're considered wealthy by the world's standards. So we have been blessed, so we need to thank God for this. See, it's, it's not money that's evil. It is the love of money, the Bible says. It's when we love money more than we do God. That's the root of all evil. Money is neutral. Remember Abraham, uh, Job, David, Solomon, they were all very rich. They managed large holdings for the glory of God. Lydia, Deborah, they were wealthy women in the Bible that God used to build his church and to build his kingdom. Remember the parable of the talents that Jesus tells? See, the parable tells us that God will hold us accountable for what has been entrusted to us. So we don't need to dig a hole and bury our assets in the ground. Instead, we use them for the glory of God. Because someday God's going to ask me. He's going to ask you, what did you do with what I gave you? We're going to give an account. And I want to be able to answer with you, Lord, I use this for your glory. And for the people that you love. I use it for your name, for your holy. Now, I need to remind us that we have money only for a little while. We have money in the stuff money buys just for a little while. Just for a little while. 
I went yesterday and, and, and did a memorial service for somebody. And you know what? I saw uh, that what they say is true. There, there is no U-Haul behind a hearse. There's just not one. We don't take it with us. We, we, we leave it behind. I heard the story about two friends that were walking away from a memorial service one day. And one of the friends said, uh, well, I wonder how much old John left behind. And the other man gave a simple but true response. He goes, well, I guess old John left it all. <laughs> That's how much he left. He left it all. See, we don't take our possessions with us, so God entrusts us for a time to manage money and the stuff that money buys. And as I mentioned, Jesus teaches a whole lot about money, and one place that he teaches about it is in Luke 16, 11 through 13. We're going to take a look at it. I'll read it out loud, Luke 16. He says, And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the rich, true riches of heaven? And if you're not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? No one can serve two masters, Jesus says. For you'll hate one and you'll love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Read the last line with me. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, does Jesus say you should not? You, you probably should not. That's not what he says, right? He says you cannot. He says it's, it's not doable. It's impossible. It's not an option. We can't do it because we're going to love one and despise the other. And God is calling us to love him above every single thing. See, nobody can serve two masters, Jesus says. You can't have two number one priorities in your life. C.S. Lewis once wrote that the only thing Christianity cannot be is modestly important. This is not modestly important. Jesus says we've got to choose. You're going to serve somebody. And if we choose to serve God, then it deserves our most enthusiastic response, our, our, our most sub submitted, humble response, like, Lord, this is what you've entrusted to me. I'm, I'm going to go all in. I'm going to do with it what you've called me to do, for I trust in you, and I know everything is, is a gift from your hand, and I'm going to manage it well because of what you have blessed me with and because of the gifts that you've given me that are priceless, the gift of salvation, the gift of your grace, the gift of your peace, the gift of your love. Would you like to be able to pray a prayer like that? It causes us to, to go all in, all in. This week I went by uh, Taco Bell. I was just uh, visiting. I was just, just <laughs> passing through. But, uh, I went through the drive-thru at Taco Bell, and uh, as I uh, drove up, I, I went to the little speaker there. I don't know why you can't talk to a real person, but first you have to stop at the speaker. So I stopped by the speaker and uh, you know, figured out what I wanted, and then uh, I, I made my order, and, I, and they said, uh, is that all? I said, yeah, that, that's going to be it. And, and the guy on the other end says, well, that's just taco-tastic. <laughs> so, what? What? So I drove up to the window, and there was this young man there. And uh, uh, he, I, I said, how's your day going today? And he goes, well, my day is taco-tastic. <laughs> and and I, I, started, I said, man... I, I'm sorry. I said, are they making you say this word, taco-tastic? I actually asked him this. And he gave me this look of just sheer despair and woundedness. He goes, sir, I say that word because I want to. I say that word because I love my job. I, I, I say this word because I want to, mister. I felt so bad. I said, well, that's just taco-tastic. I mean, <laughs> what do you... Okay. <laughs> As I drove away feeling bad for this kid, <laughs> I thought, man, this, that guy's all in. <laughs> I mean, he's been entrusted with the management of the window and the handing of the bag and the drink out and the sauces. And how is it? It's taco -tastic. That's how it is. I mean, he's, he is all in. And you know what? This is the kind of enthusiasm I believe that God calls us to. I mean, if a kid can be that excited about tacos, <laughs> every blessing we've been given, what is God calling us to do? He's calling us to be all in. Lord, I am your money manager. All right, all right. That's taco-tastic, Lord. I'm just going to do what you want me to do. I I'm going I'm to order my life in the way you want so that you can bless me even more in my life with more of your presence and your love. William Booth is somebody that did this. William Booth was a, a former Methodist pastor that was called to start an organization you've heard about. It's called the Salvation Army. His heart was broken for the poor in London, England. And so he went to serve them and give his life 
entirely for Jesus Christ. And a reporter went to him to interview William Booth. They said, how have you had so much success in your ministry? And the great soldier of the Lord replied, there are more people that are more intelligent than I am, more people that have, more great, have money and greater opportunity than I do. But from the day I got the poor of London on my heart, and I caught a vision of what Jesus Christ would do for them, I made up my mind that God should have all of William Booth that there was. Friends, does God have all of you? As a recipient of God's grace through Jesus Christ and as a manager of God's money, we are compelled out of gratitude to offer all of our lives to God. And we can trust then that God will take care of us. Wouldn't you like to have that gift? That you can know that God will take care of you. This week the teaching team found a, a prayer that will wreck your life. It's in Proverbs. And in Proverbs chapter 30, there's this little prayer just kind of hidden in there. And it's a prayer that sets us free from worry. It's a prayer that places at, us at perfect trust in God. Let's read it out loud together. Make me absolutely honest and don't let me be too poor or too rich. Give me just what I need. If I have too much to eat, I might forget about you. If I don't have enough, I might steal and disgrace your name. I want to invite you to take that prayer home with you and place it somewhere. You can pray, Lord, God, make me just absolutely honest. Don't let me be too poor, too rich. Just what I need. Just what I need. See, this will keep us from falling in the same hole over and over again. In fact, this type of prayer sends us down a different street. A man I know that learned to pray this prayer, the family friend of, of ours for my whole lifetime, this man in his late 60s, a man that used to uh, hang out with us and uh, take care of me, and I've just known him my whole life. And he was a um, follower of Jesus early in his life, but he wandered away from the faith in young adulthood, and uh, he just never really had much time for church, never had much time for, for reading the Bible or any of those kind of things. He was far, far from God, but he was an upstanding member of this community because he was a well-respected businessman in a small town in Kentucky. And when the recession hit, as it did us, the recession just, just took him out. But he didn't let anybody know. In fact, he would go first just once a month to the bank. And without telling his wife or his, his children or even his grandchildren or anybody in his life, he didn't let on to anybody. He would go and he would borrow some money against their house and the business. And Before too long, all of the equity from the business was gone. And then he started making those trips every week to keep up appearances, and before too long, all of their assets were gone. Every single thing was leveraged, and he hadn't told anybody anything. One day, my friend couldn't take the stress anymore because even the IRS was after him. And so he sat down at a kitchen table, and he wrote out a note saying goodbye to his family because he resolved to end his life. He couldn't take the stress anymore. So he finished this letter writing to many of us. And then he got up, he put his pen down on the table with the paper at the, at the kitchen, and he got up and he made his way to the front door where he was going to go out and drive and go end his life. And as he arrived at the front door, there was a young, smiling man there at the front door. And this man struck up a conversation with my friend. And this uh, young man noticed that something was going on. And my friend said, what are you doing here? Why, why are you at my front door? And the young man said, well, I'm the new minister at the Baptist church right down the street. And I'm coming around to all the houses in the neighborhood. And I just want to introduce myself and tell you, if you don't have a church home, I'd love to have you come to my church, you know. And if you need a pastor, I'm here. He noticed that something was wrong with my friend. My friend invited him in. And there for hour upon hour, they sat in the living room as my friend just unloaded all of the junk, all of the truth, all of the, the lies, everything, he came clean. And then the best part is, this young pastor led my friend to Christ. 67 years old, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And he came home again. Since that day, he's lost all his stuff. 
He had a very simple life now. But he is blessed. He's filled with joy. He's filled with peace. He's reading his Bible. He's a part of a, of a congregation, a local church, and he's got the joy of doing life together, and he's living with nothing to lose and nothing to hide and nothing to prove because he's with Jesus, and his self-worth is, is no longer tied up into his net worth. He knows Jesus as his Savior, all because some kid was led by the grace of God to go by his house and stand at the door and interrupt his plans to end his life. Friends, if we're honest, every one of us during this recession, and let's face it, before we've fallen short of God's glorious standard, haven't we? I have. Here's the good news. Hear the good news that today Jesus, he's by the door and he's knocking on the door of your heart and he's saying, let me in. Let me in so that you can have life to the absolute fullest, life way above stuff. Life with Christ. That is the rich life. That is the life we're longing for. I want to invite the band to come and we're going to sing a song that simply confesses, and it's a dangerous confession. It says, Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my heart. And for many of us, that might be, we need to come back home again. We need to come back to true north. We need to come back to Christ. And if today you want to say, Jesus, I need you to lead my life. I need you to lead my life the way you did Wes's friend a couple of years back. And I'll meet you over here at the cross as we're singing. Friends, there's no guilt here. There's no judgment. There's grace. There is unfailing, unearned, undeserved love from a God who, know, who owns everything. And what he longs for the most is you. Let's stand for prayer. Lord, we thank you that you do not waste any hurt in our life, but you are here with us in this moment. And Lord, we confess to you that when it comes to money and the stuff money buys, uh, we have we've wandered away from you. We need to come home again. We need to come back into your embrace. Or we need to receive you for the first time today. Lord, thank you that you are such a generous God, that you give your love without ceasing, and that your love is available right now in this place. Amen. Altar is open for you. If you want somebody to pray with you, lift a hand. Let's worship the Lord together.